Welcome. Awesome, it's 10 o'clock. Lovely to see all your faces here. Rain or shine, it's a good day to praise the Lord. And uh, today's the Lord's Day, so we offer the our first fruits of our, uh, our week. Um, we come here and we focus on Him, focus on His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we begin our worship, uh, we're going to sing the song, Goodness of God, as we remember the goodness of God and what he has done for us. Um, please stand if you're able. Life laid down, I surrender now. 
your neighbor and say hi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Whistler Community Church. Wow, it looks like a full house today. Please take your seats. <laughs> it's so wonderful to see all of you here today. Um, yeah, we're just so grateful for the rain today, aren't we? We really did need it. Praise God for that. Um, well, a special welcome to you if you're new here and uh, or you're just visiting. We're really glad that you're here. I see there's this large contingent, contingency here. I heard maybe from the Netherlands. I'm not sure, but welcome. <laughs> We're really great to have you. Um, if you haven't met me before, my name's Carmen. I'm a regular attendee here, and I am your service host this morning, and it is a, a privilege and an honor to be that today for you. Now, today is a little bit bittersweet. As many of you know, Pastor David and his beautiful wife, April, um, this is their last week here at the church. And so I must say that this church has been blessed so much by their service and calling here. And uh, they've just touched so many of our lives, mine included. Um, I think it's a big reason why a lot of us newbies have called this church our home, and so um, saying goodbye to them, and we're going to be honoring them later in prayer. Um, yeah, we're, we're just looking forward to sending them off in love, so uh, yeah, bittersweet. <laughs> now, before we get started, we do have a few announcements to make. Um, we do have a baptism and membership class coming up, so if you've never been baptized before um, in water and you want to learn what that's all about, we have classes in September. Uh, they run every Tuesday night uh, from 7 to 9 o'clock if you'd like to attend that. And if you have been baptized but you'd like to be a formal member of the church here, you can attend the last three Tuesdays of that class series and become a member. And for information on that, uh, you can contact Pastor Tim. Now, in the pews in front of you, we have these Connect cards. Um, we just encourage you to fill these out if you're new here, if you want to get plugged into the church, connected. If you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you. So just fill this out and drop it off in the offering box, and uh, someone from our leadership team will contact you. And it is uh, also the same place that you would drop off your uh, tithing envelopes if you'd like to give. Um, we serve a generous God, and in turn, we are called to be generous. So thank you to everyone who does regularly give. And you can also give online as well. I would like to turn it over to Paul now. He's going to uh, tell us a little bit about a, a barbecue we have coming up. everyone. Um, yeah, I'm here just to update on the barbecue that we're having on Tuesday. So we have an outreach barbecue. It's part of our year-long calendar for our outreach program. Uh, we'll be doing a dinner in October, October 8th, for the um, 
uh, Thanksgiving too. So this barbecue is just kind of light. It's uh, meant for us to kind of just connect with people in Whistler from the neighborhood, people kind of after Apare uh, coming down and having a burger with us and getting a chance to connect with people at the church. We want to be the Christian that people know in this town and get the opportunity to share the gospel with them. So this is our first kind of thing for the calendar. Uh, I'd invite everyone from the church to come. Same rules kind of apply as the other dinners, though, that we've done, is that the church people eat last. The, the food is for the guests coming through. And, uh, yeah, just get names, uh, meet people so that when you see them around town, uh, let them see something different in you as opposed to everyone else in this town. Um, any questions or if you need want to help, uh, please come talk to me after the service. I'm Paul. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks so much, Paul. Okay. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you that we can gather here together in your presence and be refreshed and renewed by your Holy Spirit. Please quiet our minds, Lord, from our busy lives. Help us to focus our whole attention on you and who you are, no matter what our past week has been like, whether We've been rejoicing or dealing with heartache. We love you, Lord. Please open our hearts to your word this morning as we worship you in Jesus' name. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to the worship team. Continue to worship. Um, um, as I was looking through the songs that we're going to sing today, um, one word just kept coming to my mind, and the word is wait. To just wait on the Lord, whether we're burdened, we wait on Him, or if we are asking for something, we wait for Him. Um, just to come before His throne, and just to wait. Uh, Reese is going to read our call to wor uh, worship for us today. Um, Reese, just come on. Uh, Psalms 37, 7 to 9. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who proposes, uh, yeah, proposes in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit, in the, inherit the land. Thank you. Please stand if you're able as we sing the next song, or come to the altar. Let's come before his altar, ready to worship, ready to offer.
But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Hebrews 2.9.
for Sunday school. Can I invite the little ones up front so we can pray for them and the teacher? Feels really lonely, kid. Two, three. Awesome. If you want to stay where you are and join us after, you can do that as well. Uh, today we're continuing our campfire stories, looking at the story uh, or the miracle of Lazarus. Uh, so that will be fun. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for uh, each of these kids, that you're yours, that they are yours, uh, and that you love them dearly. I pray that our time together, uh, you would speak to their hearts and that they would remember something about your goodness and your love for them. Bless our time together. Amen. Okay, and now it's congregational prayer time with Pastor David. join our hearts together in prayer uh, and lift them up to our Heavenly Father. We praise you, God, for who you are, a loving, all-knowing, and sovereign Father. Lord God, when we deeply trust in you and follow you as the shepherd of our life, we lack nothing. In fact, we experience life in all the fullness you've always intended for your children. Lord Jesus, when you came down to earth, you came as the good shepherd who laid down your life for us. But you also came to show us the way. Forgive us when we foolishly go our own way. Because of our old sinful and self-centered nature, we are indeed prone to wander. We ignore you, or worse yet, rebel against you. And as a result, we get ourselves into trouble and we hurt others. Like sheep, we are so utterly dependent on you, Lord, as our good shepherd. For we depend on you for nourishment, for guidance, for daily care and protection, and finding true rest. We ask that you would give us a never-ending desire, a hunger to hear your voice, to know you, and follow you. We praise you and thank you for the gift of your indwelling spirit who enables us in this way. God, we praise you for our Sunday school teachers and helpers. We thank you for their commitment to teaching our children about you, Jesus. We ask you to encourage them, especially as they work to implement curriculum that fits even better with the needs and unique challenges faced by our children today. We praise you, God, for our worship ministry team, for Steve and Tin, who lead a growing and diverse group of people who are committed and passionate about lifting you up on high with the gift of music and who take joy in working together. Father, we lift up to you Wiley, Tamara, and their daughter, Ashlyn, who serve with North American and Indigenous Ministry in Mount Curry. We ask for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit on them so that your kingdom may advance in powerful ways in the community of Mount Curry. We ask that you especially help Tamara be a comfort and your shining light to her mom, who is in palliative care in Squamish. We praise you, Lord, for Jeff and Tracy in the work you have empowered them to do with the Leadership Training School in Switzerland and in working with a team to build a home for a family in Ukraine in just five days. A young family who lost their home over 20 months ago due to the war. Lord, would you bless Jeff and Tracy with clarity and direction 
as they seek to discern how you are calling them to serve in the future. Father, we pray for the town of Jasper and the many people there who have had their homes and or businesses ravaged by wildfire. Help them. Help the town in the rebuilding process. Use this challenging time, God, to revive and unify this town for you. Thank you for all those who serve as first responders, especially those fighting wildfires. We ask you to watch over them. We pray for all those who are called to lead locally, provincially, nationally, and internationally, that they would lead with justice, mercy, and compassion, that you would convict them to make decisions that promote the way of peace and healing, and especially to be accountable to you, Lord Jesus, the Prince of Peace. We pray for Jordan and Diego as they commit to one another as husband and wife next Sunday, that you would grow them in their love, not only for one another, but in their love for you, Lord Jesus. Unify them as partners in discipleship. May this be a wonderful time of family celebration and thanksgiving. God, we acknowledge that you are the source of all wisdom. We ask you to bless our leadership and pastoral search teams in the months to come, that you would grant them great insight and unity in their decision making. We ask for your special hand of encouragement on both Pastor Tim and on Craig Allers, our moderator. Lord Jesus, would you increasingly inspire us as a church family and as individuals to be accountable to the mission and vision to which you have called us. May each person here take initiative and great joy in walking alongside others in their journey of faith. And may Whistler Community Church be increasingly known as a community of hope here in Whistler, a community that points all people to the light of Christ. In this regard, Lord, help us to reach out effectively to our neighbors, our friends and acquaintances who don't yet know you in our outreach barbecue happening this coming Tuesday night. Enable us to answer everyone who asks about the hope that we have and to do this with gentleness and respect. God, you carry us through the storms. You grow us through the storms of life. We praise you for always being our refuge and strength, a God of grace and steadfast love. And so we, your children, humbly lift up these prayers, trusting in your fatherly goodness, knowing that your saving and holy purposes will never be thwarted, but accomplished according to your perfect will and timing. In the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah? Hey, nice to see everybody today. Uh... Yeah, welcome here. My name's Tim. We're going to be opening God's Word together. We do this, if you're uh, new or visiting, we open God's Word together every single week because we believe that the words in the Bible are God's very words to His people. They were His words to His people back in the day when they were written, and by His Holy Spirit, they're His words to us today. So we open, our, we open the book every week looking to see what it, how it points us to Jesus, how it points us to the way God wants us to live today as his people. So if you have a Bible with you, can you open it to the book of Habakkuk? Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, as they would say in Hebrew. Uh, you might need to look in the table of contents in your Bible to find it. It's very short. It isn't one that many people are familiar with. 
uh, I've come to see it as a, a book written by a minor prophet uh, with a major message. So even though it's only three short chapters, there's a lot of nuggets in here for us. If you have your Bible, just keep it on your lap. Habakkuk uh, chapter 1, we'll be looking at to the beginning of chapter 2. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, be careful what you wish for? Right? It's a com common in our everyday vernacular or our everyday language. Be careful what you wish for. I think this, this phrase has actually a great deal of merit. Right? Maybe you've known somebody that, that asked for or wished for a lot of money. And they got it, and it turned them into the greediest people that you've ever met. Once they had a little bit, they had this insatiable desire for more and more and more. And what they thought would be a good thing turned into a ruling and a bad thing in their life. Maybe you know somebody that wished or asked for fame. I want to be famous. And then when they attained it, it ended up eating them alive because they could never get enough of it. They needed more and more and more. Be careful what you ask for because you just might get it is good advice. I believe it's good advice. The answer we ask for doesn't always pan out the way that we had hoped. I tell you this because I, I wonder, if you were with us last week when we looked at the first bit of the book of Habakkuk, chap, uh, verses 1 to 11, it makes me wonder if the prophet Habakkuk wished that he had been more careful about what he asked God for. Because the answer, the response that he got from God, I don't think is what he was hoping for. You see, we learned last week that this prophet named Habakkuk lived during a period of Israel's history in the southern kingdom of Israel called Judah that had gone through a period of great religious reform. Under King Josiah, they, they started to live God's ways again. And they, they were moving towards being today, we'd say, like they were a Christian nation. But then shortly after Josiah's death, when his, one of his sons, Jehoiakim, took leadership of the people, he started to lead them away from God's ways once again, to lead them back towards apostasy. So Habakkuk's living there, remembering how things used to be in the midst of things spiraling out of control and evilness, uh, evil becoming more and more rampant, and he didn't like what he saw, and it disturbed him so much that he cried out to God, Asking that God would do something about all the evil amongst his people. He said, God, where are you? When are you going to step up? When are you going to do something about all of this bad stuff? And we learned last week, God responded. He responded to Habakkuk's cries, to Habakkuk's prayers. And he said he would indeed do something about Judah's evil. He would raise up the wicked nation of Babylon, to be his instrument of judgment on his own people. Babylon's described as ruthless, feared, dreaded, guilty, proud Babylon. Imagine being told that God was raising up a pagan nation to judge a Christian nation. That's what was happening to Habakkuk and his people. So there's the background to today's text Habakkuk says, where are you, God? When are you going to do something? God says, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians. They're going to execute my judgment. They're going to discipline my own rebellious people. And not surprisingly, Habakkuk struggles to understand God's response. I, th I think we'd, we would too. How could God do such a thing? Habakkuk struggled to make sense of God and his ways. So today's text is for any of us who struggle to make sense of God and his ways. Of what we know to be true of God and how he acts in his world. When there's a perceived incongruence between who he is and how he acts. It's for those of us who have ever asked. Last week the question was, where are you, God? This week the question is, how could you, God? How could you? So we're going to look at today's section under three Headings, okay? I'll give you the headings up front. They'll be on a slide. If you're a note taker, feel free to write them down. This is where we're going. First, struggling to reconcile who God is with what he does, verses 12 to 17. Expecting God to answer, 
and then living by faith. There's the progression that we're going to be following this morning. So let's start with struggling to reconcile who God is with what he does. If you have your Bible, read along with me. Habakkuk 1, 12 to 17. This passage is similar to last week's in this, in that Habakkuk launches all these questions at God, and then God answers his questions in the subsequent section. Here's Habakkuk's, uh, it might say in your Bible, Habakkuk's second complaint, or his second round of questions. This is what he says. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them, that's Babylon, to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. But your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You've made, a peop- you've made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. And by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? How could you, God, how could you choose to use Babylon those wicked, evil people to judge the wickedness and evil amongst your own people. You can hear Habakkuk say, they're even worse than us, God. We're more righteous than they are. We're bad, but they're worse. First thing we need to notice about Habakkuk's complaints or the questions that he asked here is that it becomes very clear to us who he believed God to be. And that was the very source of his saying, how could you? So who does Habakkuk say God is? I'll just read you through some of the descriptions. Some of the things that we see in this text are his beliefs about God. He starts off saying, Lord, are you not from everlasting? Oh yeah, here you'll have all of them that I'll be going through. Lord, are you not from everlasting? When you see in the Bible, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's referring to the Hebrew name uh, for God, Yahweh. That has to do with the special covenant, the special relationship that God had with his people. So when Habakkuk refers to God as Lord, it's expressing that he knows God. He knows already that God is committed to his people because he made covenants with his people. To Abraham, God said, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the nation. I'm going to raise you up and there's going to be more of you than the stars in the sky. To Moses, he said, I'm going to deliver my people out of slavery in Egypt. To King David, he said, a a, a king in your family line will be on the throne forever. God continued to make these promises, these, these covenantal relationships with his people. And when Habakkuk here refers, when he says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? It's showing us he knows who God is. He remembers all the promises of God. He knows that God is committed to his people. He says, are you not from everlasting? He acknowledges that God's always been. From everlasting, you go all the way back to before there was a beginning. Then Habakkuk understands God will always be. He says, you will never die. You always have been. You always will be. He's the first and the last. In the book of Revelation, it would say he's the Alpha and the Omega. Then Habakkuk knows that God's personal. He refers to him as my God, my Holy One. He knows God intimately and personally. He knows that God's sovereign over the nations. He says, you, Lord, have appointed them, Babylon, to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. He understands that God rules and controls not just his people, but all of the nations of the world. Babylonians were coming, and God was the one who was making them 
come. This wasn't going to be an accident. It wasn't going to be coincidence. God was doing it. This was his will. Habakkuk understood God to be sovereign. Lastly, Habakkuk understood that God was holy. He refers to him as the holy one, and he says, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. That God is absolutely holy and pure is taught everywhere in Scripture. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, God is light in him, there is no darkness at all. God is light in him, there's no darkness at all. So there's no evil, sin, or darkness in God at all, regardless of how he acts, regardless of our in, incapability of understanding his ways. And this doesn't mean that God closes his eyes and ignores all the evil in the world because it says that he's too pure to look on evil. It isn't that God chooses not to look at all the evil in the world That's not what it means. It means that God doesn't look at sin with any type of acceptance or approval. He sees what's going on. He doesn't like it. He doesn't approve of it. When it says he doesn't, he can't look on it. It isn't that he doesn't see it. It's that he's, ugh. So we see here, God is the covenant God of Israel. He always has been. He always will be personal he's sovereign over the nations he's holy that's a pretty good list if you're into theology and an understanding of who god is that's a pretty good starting point we see that habakkuk we'd say was a really good theologian he he, his belief about god was right and true the problem was if that was who god is how could he tolerate the treacherous and be silent while the wicked swallowed up those more righteous than themselves, Habakkuk asked. If, God, all that stuff about you is true, then how could you use the Babylonians? It doesn't make sense in his mind. It doesn't. One, one response we could have to this, uh, last week I read from Isaiah 55, Verse 8 to 9 that says, The Lord's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So when Habakkuk says, How could you do that, God? One response would be just to say, Well, we'll never fully understand God and his ways and why he would do what he does. We'll never fully comprehend his ways because we're human and he's not. From Habakkuk's questions... You and I can take comfort, though, in knowing that even people who know God can struggle to understand his ways. That's encouragement for you today. Maybe you're in the midst of something right now, and you're saying, God, how could this happen? I don't understand it. You might have right belief about who God is, all these things that Habakkuk says, but you still might not understand There may still be times in your life when his ways don't make sense. They'll leave you scratching your head. Some of you might be scratching your head today with something that's going on in your life. You just don't get it. It doesn't seem to be congruent with who you know God to be. So there's the first part. Struggling to reconcile who God is with what he does. Habakkuk's journey, some of our journey. Second, Expecting God to answer. Habakkuk asked God all those questions. He's wrestling, right? Those are real and honest wrestling. And then chapter 2, verse 1, says this. I will stand at my watch, and I'll station myself on the ramparts, describing he's standing on the walls of Jerusalem. I'll look to see what he, God, will say to me, and what answer I'm going to give to his to this complaint. I'll stand at my watch, my station. I will wait. So he asks God really difficult questions. He processes out loud. And then he waits for a response. He stands at attention on the walls of Jerusalem. It's like he's just waiting to see Babylon advancing. Look, see what the Lord is going to 
say. You could say he expects, he asks these questions, and he, do, he knows that they're going to a personal God, and he expects a response. He expects a back and forth with God. I wonder how many of us expect a back and forth with God when we pray. How many of our prayers are just one way? All we do is talk to God. We tell him what we want, what we need, what we think we want and need. Could you do this? Could you do that? But then we don't wait to listen for his response. We don't wait to see what he wants to do. We just move ahead to the next thing. Habakkuk knows that God listens and he knows that he speaks, so he waits. I wonder when you pray, do you expect God to answer? Do you listen for it? Is your prayer life a one-way dialogue or a conversation? Now, you might not hear God answer you like Habakkuk does, right? This seems like God just speaks, or we'll see in a second, God speaks, and Habakkuk hears his voice audibly. Some of us uh, have never heard God's voice audibly, but you can be confident that God speaks to you through Scripture. When, you, when you're praying about something, you can look for God's answer through Scripture because that's his word spoken and written down for us. If you're waiting for an answer from the Lord, sometimes it'll come to you in a still small voice. He'll speak deep inside of you, and you'll just know that it's God telling you what to do or, or something like that. Or God might speak to you through other believers. You ever had a time like that? You're wrestling with a decision, and someone else who knows God comes to you with an answer that you just know is from God because it checks out with Scripture. It doesn't contradict other stuff that God has said. So Habakkuk says his piece. He waits for God's answer. I think that should be the pattern in our lives as well. When we pray, we ask God, we wait, we listen, knowing that he will answer, expecting a response. There's the second point, expecting God to answer. Okay, so str he's struggling to reconcile who God is with what he does. He cries out to God. He, he expects God to answer. He says, I'm just waiting here, Lord. What answer are you going to give me? How are you going to respond to my objections? The third part is living by faith. Living by faith. Habakkuk asked God how he could use Babylon to judge, and God's response is awesome. He says, don't worry. Babylon is going to get theirs. They're going to get what they deserve too, Habakkuk. I'm going to use them. They're going to judge, but then they're going to get it. Trust me, he says. Verses 2 to 5. Habakkuk 2, 2 to 5. The Lord's answer. This is what Habakkuk heard after he was waiting and standing at watch. It says, then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. So he says, I want everybody to know what I'm going to tell you. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. So what I say is going to happen is going to take a little while. It speaks of the end, and it will not prove false. In other words, God says, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Though it linger, wait for it. It'll certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy's puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. Indeed, wine betrays him. He's arrogant and never at rest because he's greedy as the grave. And like death is never satisfied, he gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Here's what I want to point out about God's response here is, don't worry, Babylon's going to get it. It's going to happen. It's going to be their end. You're going to have to wait for it a little while. But it will certainly come. Now, we're, this was all happening about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. So this is, this is a long time ago. And if you're not familiar with, with history at the time, so first God says Babylon's going to judge Israel. In uh, 587, Babylon indeed captured Jerusalem. They took over Judah's capital. So God saying that Babylon was going to judge, it happened, 587. Babylon's judgment came in 539 when they were sacked and wiped out by the next rising world power. So in history, all of these things have happened. What God 
said he would do, he did. It happened just as God said that it would. I want to point out two things from this final section that we're looking at. Two things that we learn. The first is this. God does what he says he will do. That's basically God's message to Habakkuk. Just wait, I'm going I'm to take care of it. I'm going to do what I say I will do because that's just who I am. Um, a couple months ago, I had to interview somebody for a school project in, in my master's program. And I had to interview somebody with, a, with leadership experience just to try and glean some stuff from them. And I never told them I was going to tell this, but I interviewed Craig uh, Allers, our, our moderator, because he's got a lot of years of corporate leadership experience. And I thought it would be great just to sit down and just pummel him with questions about his, his life in, uh, in that realm for years. Now, while I interviewed him, there, there was something that he said a few times that stood out to me. And it was, it was this, that in the, the corporate environment that he used to be in, when they were, uh, when they were giving, oh, what's the right word? When they were thinking about how they would rate their employees, there was a, something that they would use to rate how good of an employee they were, how good their managers were. And it was what they called the say-do ratio. The say-do ratio, what that means is how often did the manager actually do what he said he was going to do? So they called it the say-do because you want somebody to do what they say they're going to do. That's what makes a good manager in a company. That's how you build trust amongst employees is so that when they hear their boss say, this is what I'm going to do, they do it. And if they don't do it, then trust is lost, right? We know that in our lives, even outside of business. And I love this idea. It's, I think about it all the time, just the say-do ratio. Do we do what we say we're going to do? Is that building trust in relationship with other people? I thought that was, that was brilliant in that business culture, but here's what struck me this week when I was thinking about this point and this story in Habakkuk. It's that God has the perfect say do ratio. God's the only one who's perfect in that regard. He always does what he says he's going to do. That's what he does in history, in world events today, in your life, in my life, whatever. God has the perfect say do ratio. We can count on him. We can count on him. We can trust him. And he tells Habakkuk to wait for what he's going to do. Wait for it. It will certainly come, he says. I love that Danielle pointed out those words, wait, in the music. We didn't talk about that. She didn't know that I was going to talk about that. But I believe, Danielle, that was a word from the Lord for us today. Wait for it. Whatever it is you're waiting for, for. These are words that we should cling to in hope when we're confused or when we feel that God's silent, when we're between jobs, needing housing, wanting answers to where we should go, what we should do. Wait on the Lord. Cry out to him and wait for a response. He's faithful. He has the perfect say do ratio. His answer in the completion of his plan will certainly come it says, meaning take it to the bank. It will certainly come. The problem is we find it so hard to wait on the Lord, don't we? It is so hard to wait. If we're waiting for an answer, it's so much easier to panic and stress and go ahead. It's so much harder just to say, God, it's in your hands. I'm going to wait. I know you're going to do what you're going to do. I want to partner with you. But we're to wait because God does what he says he will do. He'll look out for us. And last thing we learn from this section is that the Christian life is a life of faith. This fits in with everything that's come before. God's response, wait, I'm going to do it. I do what I say I'm going to do. Trust me. At, at its base level, that's what faith means. It just means to trust God, to, to leave it in his hands, knowing that he's good, that he loves, 
that he's just, that he's going to take care of it. And in this text, uh, God contrasts Babylon with his righteous people. He says, Babylon's going to live by pride and wicked desires. He's going to be arrogant, greedy, oppressive, will never be satisfied. But the righteous, by contrast, will live by his faithfulness, it says. Or the ESV translation says, he will live by his faith. He'll, he'll trust God. God's people will trust in God. You may have heard these words, live by faith. The righteous will live by faith before. If you've read through the New Testament, it's quoted at least three times by the Apostle Paul and the writer of the book of Hebrews. It, it was actually a phrase that, that haunted Martin Luther so much. What does it mean that the righteous will live by faith that he started uh, the Protestant Reformation? These words, the righteous will live by faith, were revolutionary back then and they are today too. In Romans 1, 16 to 17, I'll give you one of the examples where the Apostle Paul quotes this phrase. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Believe. Same idea as faith or trust. Everyone who trusts receives salvation, he says, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is Reveal the righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as, as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. The gospel, if you don't know, that Paul's referring to is the good news. The good news that God sent his son Jesus to be the savior of the world. That through his death and resurrection, people, you and I, can be led out of slavery Spiritual slavery to sin and death and into the freedom of being called sons and daughters of the living God. And the way, Paul says, that we receive this salvation is through faith. By just trusting God. By trusting that Jesus did everything necessary to accomplish our salvation. To make our right relationship with God available. So the Christian life begins with trusting Jesus, having faith in Jesus. But something that we see Paul write here is that it's from, by faith from first to last. Meaning the Christian life begins with trusting Jesus and it continues to trust Jesus, even when life or God's ways don't make any sense to us. Even when we say, how could you, God? The Christian life is one of saying, I don't know, but you do. I trust you. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, the Apostle Paul writes, For we live by faith, not by sight. We live by faith. If you're here today and you're a Christian, this, here, this should be a life verse. Live by faith, not by sight. Sight meaning what you can see. Faith being trust what you can't yet see. And it's not trust like wishful thinking. It's a rooted confidence in the God who says that he's going to do it. Because he never fails. He's ever faithful. He does what he says he's going to do. He's going to get there in the end. So if you're struggling to make sense of God and his ways, if what you know to be true of God isn't jiving with what he's doing in your life today, call out to him like Habakkuk, remember who he is. He's faithful, he's sovereign, he's holy. He gave his own son for the forgiveness of your sins. Remember who he is, then expect him to answer. Wait for it. Just wait. And lastly, trust him. He'll give you what's best. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for who you are in this text. I thank you that you allow Habakkuk to bring his complaints to you. You hear him, you listen to him, and you answer him. God, thank you that when we bring our complaints or our questions to you, our, our not understanding uh, what you're doing in the world or in our lives today, when we bring those to you, you hear us and you answer us. Help us to wait. Help us to do the hard work of waiting. 
Help us to trust you. By your Holy Spirit, help us to live by faith. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, now, while the music team comes up, I want you to turn to your neighbor and share one thing that you're going to take away from God's word today. Go. Let's respond with uh, one last worship song. And this song is uh, actually, the words of it is actually from Psalm 62, the words of David. And I feel like it's such a good response for um, what we've heard and what we've learned today. So the, verse, the first verse, it says, When the enemy surrounds and my heart grows faint within, when the darkness overwhelms and my fears are pressing in, I will trust in you, O Lord. In the silence I will wait. I will stand upon your word. So please stand if you're able, and then we'll sing this song together.
my solid rock and my salvation my steadfast hope that won't be shaken my soul will wait my soul will wait for you you're my comfort when i feel forsaken my refuge and my sure foundation my soul will wait my soul will wait for you you music team this is this is a time when normally we'd give a benediction but that's not going to happen just quite yet i invite you to have your seat like carmen mentioned uh at the beginning of the service this is a little bit different because it's pastor david and april's last sunday with us uh here today they've been on a journey of waiting on the lord and trusting in the lord and they could share testimony of god coming through at just the right time uh, this week. Um, in, in April, Pastor David uh, announced to us that he and April would be putting their condo on the market to move down to the Fraser Valley at uh, whenever the condo sold, sometime in the summer. And that happened last week. Praise God. Yeah, we've been in support. We've been, we've been praying for that for them, and they've been able to purchase something uh, to put an offer in and a deposit on on another place there so we've been journeying with them in this whole thing of god where are you and this doesn't make sense we thought we had it all figured out but you put a little hitch here and there and there and all along i think the lord was saying hey keep trusting me i got this i got you um so today is a bittersweet a bittersweet day because it's the day that we're gonna we're gonna kind of say goodbye for now right any any goodbye this side of Eternity will be picked up later on, and we'll say hello again. Uh, so it's not a forever goodbye, but it's a, hey, we're, we want to we let you guys know we love you, we appreciate you, and, uh, and that. So David and April, can you guys come up here, please? I just want to say we're, we're really appreciative of David and April's ministry among us for the last three years. I've been here a year and a half. David was here a year and a half. Uh, before, and David, it's been a privilege to shepherd God's flock alongside you, brother. And uh, we want to we wish, we want to wish you guys uh, really well. We're going to miss you guys. We're so thankful for all of your ministry. When I was thinking this morning of the different initiatives that, David, you started up with prayer Thursdays and and different baptism membership things in April with women's ministry, Rise Up, and VBS stepping up and, and leading that a couple years ago, uh, Thriving Moms. We're so thankful. You guys have been a gift, and we're so excited 
to support you in this next season as you move on to this next chapter. And we know you're anticipating it and looking forward to it. And we just want to say thank you. Could the congregation show your appreciation, please? Yeah. And uh, David and April, you guys don't know this is happening, but we have a video message from the Pazook family uh, because John wanted to get to say, uh, to wish you guys well. If, if you're visiting, you don't know, John was the lead pastor here before I was when, when David joined the team. So Zane, could you hit play, please? It's just, it's short. Okay, Daddy's going to be going his last. Okay, Daddy's going to be going his last. We didn't test it. Hi, David and April. Greetings from Abbotsford. We just wanted to wish you uh, a warm blessing as you guys are making this transition and your season in, in Whistler is ending. We really appreciated having you in our lives. We appreciated doing ministry and life and community together with you. And we know that the Lord will continue to bless you and use you as you move on to a new community and are close to your grandkids. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. We love you guys and we look forward to connecting in the Lower Mainland soon. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. That's awesome. Very awesome. Uh, this is Craig. He's our... Uh, leadership team moderator and Craig's got a few words yeah I just wanted to say a couple of things so you know David and April it's been awesome having you here over these past three years for everyone who doesn't know the history like you know David stepped in at the time we just opened the building or a couple of days before and so you know there's been a huge amount of effort that he's been involved in in running this building setting it all up in addition to the ministries um, that Tim has referenced but it's also been great personally. You know, you, you walked with me as we, I went through my uh, baptism and membership. I appreciate that. I appreciate working with you um, through men's ministry as well. And also want to call out, like, when we hired David, we said that he was, like, to the, the preach once a week, uh, once a month. And then for nine months or so, there was a period that he was preaching every week because we didn't have a lead pastor he did that willingly it, with a servant heart. When we didn't have a worship team, we, we kind of lost three of our worship leads at one stage. And then, you know, David and April stepped into that as well. So the way you guys have served us and just stepped in, even as things have changed, they weren't what you originally signed up for, but you always did it kind of willingly. So I really appreciate what, you're, um, what you've done with us. And on behalf of the leadership team, I'd like to present you with a gift. Thank you. You can open it. Yeah. <laughs> right on. You go. Yeah, thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, April and I have loved being part of this church family. It's been uh, very... Uh, exciting a very exciting three years and a challenging three years um yeah we've definitely grown up a little bit and yeah look at my head you know i mean <laughs> we're always in the lord we're always growing he's always teaching us uh just a few highlights um yeah it's been it's been a highlight certainly for me to pray together every thursday morning um we've done this uh now every thursday morning for almost two years and uh, it's just a wonderful thing to be part of. So I encourage you to do that. I know there's some thinking about starting that up at another time during the week or an evening that might work better. So I encourage you to do that. It's been a privilege to work with the leadership team. Um, it's, you know, our team is small but very tight. And um, it's a lot of fun, actually. To work as a leadership team it's really really good uh, to be part of our summer 2023 VBS 
camp was a real joy and an incredible team effort. And April and I will always remember that fondly. I think it's, it's uh, what was it, Carmen? 41, 42 people? Yeah, it was a Herculean effort, but actually not so bad with that size of a team, you know? Um, it was fabulous to walk with eight other men through the book, Man in the Mirror, solving the 24 problems that men face, only 24. Uh, we had four successive six-week small group meetings, and that was really rich to walk through that. Um, it's been a real honor to walk with 14 of you closely through the last three years as you've taken the steps of baptism and membership or just simply transferring your membership. Um, our three-week Hope Explored Outreach Initiative is an incredible fit for Whistler and its seasonal workers and adventure seekers who come and go. Uh, so please support this in whatever way you can. My parting words, uh, keep on praying as a church. As Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century Baptist preacher said, prayer is the powerhouse of the church when it comes to revival. So, and pray especially for your leaders and their families. This work is hard. Um, it can be very discouraging. There's a lot of spiritual warfare going on. You need to be praying for your leaders always. Cherish value and encourage people of all ages can truly help and we need one another and if you're not already serving in this church buddy, um, find your place as small as you think it might be it it will you will be blessed and more importantly you'll be a blessing to others so thank you guys we love you and it's been a privilege to be here and an honor to be part of this church family and you'll see us again soon this one on? Yeah. So Dave and April, can you guys come stand down here, please? And I want to invite church family, if you guys know them, love them, feel free, come up. We want to just gather around, uh, gather around them to send them out in prayer. Um, I've asked Irene and Tin if they would be willing to pray in the microphone on all of our behalf for them so Irene I'll hand you this and when you're done when you're done praying if you could find Tin oh, he'll come stand with you so please please join uh, Irene and Tin in prayer um, just before I pray I was going to say as I got to know David and April better after they first came I told them to promise that they would never leave but <laughs> here we are <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a sad day but it's a wonderful day to rejoice uh, about all the work that they've done with us and the blessings and I know I've personally gained from that as well and I'm very grateful so I'll pray now Father God you know who we needed you knew who we needed at our church and you sent David and April we have been blessed immen immeasurably by them. We'll think about and miss David and April as they move away from serving here. May we pray for them each time they come to mind. We pray that their new home, their neighborhood, their new church, and their families will be blessed by them, and that they will always be aware of your presence. We send them off knowing that they are firmly planted in our hearts and in your hands and on your path. Amen. Thank you, Irene. My prayer is a little bit longer, so hold on tight, people. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, your name is great and you have power over all dominions. You sent your faithful servants, David and April, to our church three years ago when we needed them the most, even though we didn't know it then. 
They have been great mentors and caring brother and sister who walked alongside us. Father, you gave them abilities and servant hearts to shepherd this church, from preaching sermons to leading worships, from carrying the building to carrying people, from supporting every ministry within this church to blessing the Whistler community with music education, from hosting Bible studies to even small things like snow clearing, lawn mowing, even toilet papers changing. <laughs> your, faithful, well, your faithful servants, David and April, never shied away from attending our spiritual and practical needs. They reached out to many of us outside of this church building as well, when no one is watching. They love you and serve you in secret. They sowed seeds in our lives, prayed for us, and built us up through your teachings. For all these things, we're forever grateful to how you used them mightily in this past season. Father, your name is greatly glorified through that dedication to this church. Great bondings, trusts, and relationships are built in the past few years. They faithfully follow your will to serve your people. We pray that you will continue to lavish your blessing over them and empower them to keep pressing on wherever you are going to call them to be in the next season of their lives. Again, we're sad to see them go, but we trust that you have prepared a new chapter in their walk with you. In Matthew 25, verse 23, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the, the joy of your master. Lastly, Father, we give thanks for all the wonderful deeds you have done in our lives through your servants, David and April. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And while, while you're all still here and still sitting here, let me send us out with this benediction, okay? Uh, this is for David and April and all of us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. You're loved. See you next week. Stick around for coffee.